I Want You to Want Me. Raise your hand if you know that song. Maybe you saw the movie 10 Things I Hate About You. If you're a little younger, right? I want... I do a little karaoke. Um, <clears throat> guys, my name is Gary Falkowitz. Uh, and uh, first, let me uh, thank uh, the organizers here, Jim and Tyson, for doing a fantastic job. Uh, really impressed by what you've created. And I've been following you guys for a while. We had some calls, so kudos to you and keep it up. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'll apologize for the New York accent, right? Uh, I tend to be loud and fast, so uh, I could preface it with the apologies so later on you can't get mad at me. Um, quick background on myself. Um, I'm an attorney. I've been practicing for 15 years. Uh, by the way, is there a clicker for that? or? I can keep going until we figure it out. I don't think it's here. Um, I've been practicing for 15 years, um, and I had, I jumped to the point where I was managing the intake for Parker Wakeman, a national PI law firm in New York. And it was three weeks into my tenure there, and I go, wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I said, wow, what is going on here? We have these Blackberries, we're getting these leads. Um, I'm seeing some, I'm hearing about some of the numbers for cases we were resolving, or what we were resolving cases for, and I was intrigued because they didn't teach me, as I'm sure they didn't teach you, about how to run a law firm in law school and how to run that business. So I immediately went to my boss, Jerry Parker, and said, Jerry, thanks so much for this opportunity. Oh, by the way, if another opportunity comes up within the firm where I can get involved in the business side of things, that would be wonderful. And he sort of gave me those, uh, that, the words of, hey, uh, thank you, but please go back to your office and, and do what I paid you to do. Um, I guess luck has it, uh, I got uh, promoted to managing attorney intake uh, department. I ended up being the face of the law firm on TV, uh, ended up managing our intake process, our referral process, got to know a lot of lawyers in the business, and I realized that there was a tremendous hole in our industry, and it was at the intake level, and we were leaving way too much money on the table. And the goal for all of us Right? At the end of the day is to sign more cases without spending any more money on marketing. Now, you guys know what's going on here. You see what's being spent. Right? You see that you know what the cost per clicks are. You know that best mesothelioma lawyer. This is old, by the way, so it's probably 30% more than that, I'm sure. Right? We have to spend a lot of money. Most expensive keywords, lawyers right up there next to... Uh, Casino, which is really no coincidence, is it, because we're gambling. Um, but why? Why are we spending so much money? And the, and the reason is very simple. Because our ability to make money on a retained case is very high, and we can make a lot of money from those cases that we retain. Guys, um, it might be as simple as, let's go spend another half a million dollars on marketing. Let's make that phone ring. Uh, let's get those leads, those web chats, and then the web inquiries. But that's going to get you leads. The goal is not to get the most leads. The goal is to get the most retained cases. And this is how it really works, and this is big. You've got to have a bridge. You have to understand that there is a bridge between what the claimant wants and um, what you want. And I want to go back for a moment because I kind of forgot what the, the whole reason I said that song, I want you to want me. Now, you might think it's because you're a lawyer and you really want these claimants to want your services and, uh, and we just want more and more clients. That's not my point. My point is, in this day and age, the claimants have so many options at their fingertips that when they call you, they want you to want them. They want you to want them so bad that they don't have to call anybody else. And if they're not convinced that you want them as a client, they'll just call one of the other law firms. I'm going to throw out a little test real quick, by the way. Um, I have a book. It's a complete guide to law firm intake. If you take a picture of me or video of me and you post it on social media and you uh, tag me and you do say something about intake, hashtag intake, uh, I will send three copies of my book to your law firm. And I promise you that there are some nuggets, uh, valuable nuggets uh, in that book. So they want you to want them. Now, the thing about this bridge is, in this day and age, how easy is it for a claimant to find a lawyer? Everybody I know, everybody I know who's an adult, maybe some kids know also, they know the beat to Salino and Barnes. Salino and Barnes, injury attorney, right? You know it. You should know it. Even if you don't live in New York, I'm sure you've heard it, right? It's so easy to find a lawyer. 
It's so easy to speak with two, three, four lawyers. I am moving. I had to contact, and I always contact, because I'm always thinking about um, considering my options, whether it's just a, uh, how much money I'm spending or the quality of service. So I'm moving, and I had to contact multiple moving companies. And I got to tell you, I went with... I went with one of the more expensive moving companies because of the conversations I had with him and because he made, it feel, it made me feel like he knew what I was going through. The cheapest one, which probably some people would have gone with because it didn't matter, it was less money, it was a robotic conversation. Robotic, here are the numbers, this is what it is. Blah, blah. I needed more. And the reality is he didn't realize that I, or maybe he didn't care that I had options. At the end of the day, our claimants have options at their fingertips with these smartphones with the web, right, the advent of the internet. They can, they, can, they can copy, if you haven't seen it, I could tell you, as a CEO of an intake company that handles general answering service and intake and retention for law firms throughout the country, I could tell you that claimants will copy the summary of their circumstance and then paste it on five other law firm sites. And who usually wins? Say it. The first one who responds. So now, the more apparent and more attractive your bridge is, the easier it is to cross. Now, you might say, Gary, what, do you, what, do you, what does that mean? Well, when a claimant calls up and you ask them, well, can you get me that police report? I'd love to see that police report to see what it says because there are some questions here. Does that make it easy for the claimant? You want me to go back and do work? I have another law firm I just spoke to that said they'll have someone at my house in two hours, and you want me to go get a police report so you can review it. Guys, 20 years ago, on a Friday evening, if you were an attorney, you can get a call from a new lead, tell that claimant that the case seemed very interesting, call back on Mon tell them that you'd call back on Monday about whether you can help, and 20 years ago, you probably still had a good shot at signing that claimant. I dare you, and I really don't dare you, but I dare you to try that now. And we'll talk about some of these more detailed um, things that you can focus on at your own law firm. So have a, more, have a more attractive bridge because you've, if you're making it difficult for a claimant to sign with you, if you tell a claimant, well, I can have someone at your house on Friday at 3 o'clock and today is Wednesday and it's 2 o'clock. Oh, you can have someone at my house at Friday at 3 o'clock. I happen to be busy at Friday at 3 o'clock. When's your next appointment? It's not about you. It's about the claimant. Think about the question from I can have someone at your house tomorrow at 3 o'clock to... I can have someone there as soon as possible. How's today in an hour? Make it about the claimant. I get passionate. I get loud. I'm sorry. Okay, this is a big one. Blackjack. Raise your hand if you played blackjack before. Okay. The ones that didn't raise, I know you played blackjack too. Um, the way you win in blackjack is you have to make an assumption. You have to assume that the dealer has a 10 that's face down. And... Um, then you make a decision because the statistics say or show, reveal, that if you act based upon that assumption, you're putting yourself in a better position to win. Same thing goes right now with our law firms. If your intake specialist, if your law firm, if your process is not assuming that the claimant has already called two other law firms, you'll lose. You know, you talk about, and I, and I, and I thank uh, Seth and Harlan and these guys they are shoulder deep in what they do. And Harlan always says, you don't know what you don't know. Um, if you're not reacting to today's, to the society of where we are right now from, a, from, from uh, a, a technology standpoint, and you're not changing, and you're not adapting, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage to your competitors. You just are. And here's something that I'd like you to do. I want you to go back to your office. And I want you to ask whether it's, listen, we have a whole slew of lawyers here. We have law firms that are solo practitioners. We have law firms that have 10 plus lawyers. Whoever picks up the phone for you at your law firm, I want you to ask them that if a claimant contacted us and one of our competitors, why would they choose us? They need to be able to answer that question, guys whether it's statistics about how good your law firm is, how friendly you are, how experienced you are, how personable that intake specialist is. I don't care. She, could, she or he could say, well, because I'm really a nice guy. 
and I get along great with, Inta- with claimants. Fine. That's good. That's something to build on. But if your staff, if your receptionist, if your paralegal can't answer that question, then it goes back to you don't know what you don't know. You have to be acting under the assumption that you have competitors. Even, now, I consult law firms on intake as well. I'm shoulder deep in this stuff, guys. I left that law firm, and they're a great law firm. I left the law firm to begin consulting law firms on intake so that I can help them figure out where their holes are in their law firm. Then I opened up a call center where um, law firms will outsource their general answering service or their intake and retention for some of the higher volume mass towards stuff to my company. And I have my own law firm, getgary.com. So I'm, I'm, I am shoulder, head deep. I'm underwater in intake. I love every second of it. You have to understand how much more revenue you can have if you maximize your intake process. So here's a question for you. Raise your hand if you have money in the stock market. I'm not going to ask you how much. How much? Okay, everyone has. Good. A lot of people do. Raise your hand if you have a stockbroker or someone that manages your investments. Okay. Raise your hand if you have someone that manages your intake process. Fewer hands. Fewer hands. I'll tell you why that's interesting. And I have it somewhere. Here it is. If your stock portfolio, if your portfolio doubled or tripled in three to five years, you would be ecstatic. Right? And you have this broker who's making sure that you're selling when you're supposed to sell and buying when you're supposed to buy. And you'd be ecstatic if you could double or triple that, your investment. Yet in our industry, we're not doubling or tripling our, co- our, our initial investment. Sometimes we're doing a 10x, a 50x, a 1,000x return on our investment in our business. I'll even go one step further. Sometimes our cost per acquisition was $0 because of our reputation within the industry and because of our relationships. And when we made money, you can't even compute what your ROI is because there was no cost per acquisition. It was your friend's cousin who knows you're a personal injury lawyer or some other type of lawyer. Yet we don't have someone managing the front end of our business. And I'm not pointing fingers, right? Because I've been there. I've fixed it for multiple law firms. But if you guys are going to spend money, we're in a very interesting uh, environment where we can't call, call people. I told you before how I want you to want me. We, we, a lot of us, put our own money out there gambling, hoping that someone's going to call us up. Now, uh, Tyson was saying that in Missouri, you get to send something out 30 days later. That's pretty cool. You don't get to do that everywhere. Um, we're everywhere else or most other places. You've got to put your name out there. You put your phone number out there. Have a really attractive story and hope that they give you a call. Hopefully, they only give you a call, but they're going to call multiple. We can. People like to call it sales, and I have. I am not offended by that. It is sales, but it's more than sales. It's reassuring. Someone is calling you. They are interested in your service. They haven't chosen your service. They're interested in your service. Now you got to bring them to your, you got to bring them over the bridge and reassure them that they did the right thing by calling. And my question to you is, if the ROI could be so tremendous, why aren't we putting more time and effort and potentially money into ensuring that we're not losing or minimizing that ROI? Why aren't we treating our law firm's investments the same, if not better, than we treat our personal investments? A little comic for you there. Hopefully it gives you a little bit of a smirk. Okay, unlike the stock market, here's what's interesting. Again, we have that stockbroker, but here's what's funny. Unlike the stock market, we have real control over the results. We have a roadmap in terms of how to litigate a car accident case. You guys can do that in your sleep. You know how to maximize the ROI of those cases 99 out of 100 times. We know how to maximize value, how to negotiate, and we know how deep the pockets of where we're trying to get money from are. Yet again, we have a stockbroker hoping that he doubles or triples our investment. And here we are where we're doing a 10x or 20x and we kind of just close our eyes, throw money in the, in the air and hope that it works out for the best. So what's the best metric available to assess your intake? I'm sure you've heard these terms before, but I want to go through it from my own definition and my own experience. Conversion percentage. 
your conversion percentage, your conversion percentage is this, and I'll go through it again in a moment. If you have 100 cases that qualify for retention, how many of those did you retain? If you retained 80 of them, then you have an 80% conversion rate. If you retained 40 of them, then you have a 40% conversion rate. And let me be clear about something here, guys. Time is not on your side. You must maximize the time on that first phone call when you're speaking with a claimant so that you never have to call them back again. Now, is that going to happen all the time? Of course it's not. But I'll tell you one of the issues that most law firms have. They don't empower their staff to determine whether a case qualifies on that first call. So what happens is they have to call back or say, you know what, I'll be right back. I got to go speak with a lawyer or I got to, that could be interesting. Let us figure, let's do some investigation and you will lose. Educate and empower your staff to understand what types of cases you want and get them signed up and make sure you reassure that claimant and you clearly communicate to that claimant that this meets our criteria. And let's talk about it. Generally speaking, What's the worst that can happen? You sign a case that you don't want and you reject it post-retention. Yes, I know there are some state rules about having to file this or file that, and that's fine. Most of the time, it requires a phone call and a letter if you don't want that case. Now, if your process in-house doesn't allow you or, or, or give you the ability to review those retained cases immediately, that's a whole other issue. But your job is that when a case qualifies, get that case retained as soon as possible. And make sure your staff can qualify that case on the first call. I put up these numbers. Generally speaking, for general negligence cases nationwide, the average conversion percentage of qualified cases is 70 to 75%. That means we're leaving 25 to 30% of cases that we want on the table. People that contacted us. For mass torts, which a lot of my clients do mass torts, the average is 50 to 60%. That's 40 to 50% we leave on the table. Why the number's so low? Competition is intense and we have too many leaks in our process. That's it, it's that simple. We're not aware or we don't appreciate the level of competition or we don't have the appropriate or most efficient process in place to maximize our conversion percentage. So where should the numbers be? Well, for you general negligence or auto accident law firms out there, because you have the ability to see these claimants face-to-face, -face, it should be greater than 90%. For those mass tort law firms, it should be greater than 75%, which means that there's a lot of room for improvement. You can see that right there. And I don't know what your average fee is. I just took a nice round number. Some law firms, it's more than that. Some, it's less. But you see the difference. 10 more cases is a big deal. 50 more cases is a big deal. And that's not about spending more money in marketing. That is not about spending more money in marketing. It's about maximizing what you do when those calls or leads come in. There's one law firm I just had a conversation with. They just sent me an email this morning. Their phone calls are going dead early on in the conversation. That's a leak in the process. There's another story I just heard today where a law firm had a phone number that was marketed and it wasn't even working and it may not have been working since March of last year. Those are leaks in the process. And unfortunately for all of us, including myself, for all of us, we have leaks in the process. And if we don't have someone that's looking or reviewing over what that process is to ensure there are not inefficiencies or huge holes, then we don't know what we don't know. And we're certainly not maximizing our revenue. Now, these are my own KPIs, key performance indicators, statistics, that I want you to be aware of. And I want to go through them pretty quickly with you. Your want percentage. Gary, what's that? So don't confuse me. Okay. If I get 1,000 leads last month, how many qualified? When you hear the word qualified, or you hear the word want, it's the same thing in my opinion. How many of them qualified? And remember, we have to make that qualification decision on the first call. We do not have the luxury to say, I'll give you a call back in a week after I review the facts of your case, do some case law studies, and speak to some colleagues or another law firm or something. 
How many of those cases, what's your want percentage? Why is that important? It tells you how your marketer, marketing's doing, right? It tells you what, I wanna know my cost per qualified case. Is that here as well? No, good, because it's the same thing. My cost per qualified case. Everybody's like, oh, what's your, what's your cost per retainer? What's your cost per lead? That's not so important. If you wanna judge your marketing, it's what's your cost per qualified case. If my marketer is getting me 5,000 leads and my cost per lead is 80 cents, that means nothing to me if I only wanted one case and I spent $50,000. You got to know. What, so if you're qualifying appropriately, and they talked about automation, they talked about software, and if you're using the appropriate software, you should easily know, here are the cases I got, here are the leads I got from this marketing source, here are the leads from that marketing source that I wanted, and here's my want percentage. Why, why that's important going forward is so that you can hold your marketing company accountable. Hey, you know, you guys have been great. It's been a 35% want percentage. 35% of your leads have been qualified every month for the last year, and you just were at 4%. What happened last month? Can you get it fixed? Do you know what it is? Because we've been using the same criteria for the last two years. Big deal. Next, your conversion percentage, we just talked about it. You need to know that. What does that tell you? Does that tell you about your marketing? No, it doesn't. It tells you about your intake process. If you're signing 100 out of 100 cases that you want, you got a strong intake process. You might want to actually loosen up the criteria and get more cases. But if your conversion percentage is 40%, that's an issue. That's an, and by the way, I've seen both. I've, seen, I've, I've consulted with law firms that are signing 400 cases a month, and their conversion rate hovers around 96%. Yes, I said that correctly. 400 cases they're retaining a month, and their conversion percent is around 96%. I've seen law firms that retain about 100 cases a month, and their conversion rate was at 40-something percent. But we're all fallible. We, you know, we, we all have issues. Your retained percentage. Of those leads, how many did I retain? You want to know your cost per retainer. You want, to know your cost per, you want to know your cost per qualified case? You want to know your cost per retainer? It's important to know. Your average time to follow up on web leads. Guys, do some research here. What is it? Are you waiting an hour? Are you not following up on a web lead that comes in on a Saturday morning at 11 a.m. until Monday at 10 a.m.? Are you not following up on a web lead that comes in at Thursday night at 7.30 until Friday at 9 a.m.? It's a big deal if you're not. In this day and age, we better be 24-7 one way or another. You want to outsource it to my company, outsource it somewhere else, you better have someone picking up those phone calls and calling back those leads. I'm not saying the 3 a.m. ones, those could be a little bit inappropriate sometimes, although I've made that call. I promise you I have. Um, you need to know what the average is. Is your staff telling you, when you sit down and talk to your staff, are they saying, oh, no, no, we get to them, but we wait until 2 o'clock to call them back? I've heard that before. You have to assume that the claimant that just contacted you contacted two other law firms. Yes, I'm repeating myself. Yes, I believe that's the best way to teach. I know it's the best way that I learned. Uh, average no response time before quitting. Let's figure out those words. Average no response time before quitting. In other words, how long did you go radio? How long was the claimant radio silent for? That you said, ah, they're not, they're not interested in us. They haven't called us back. It's been four days. Now. I will tell you from first to every, by the way, everything I'm telling you, everything I'm telling you is from experience. It's not gospel. It's not fact, but it's from experience. So I saw it. Okay. So I need to say that. So you don't think I'm making something up to make my lecture or conversation more effective. Um, in my company where we handle the retention for some law firms, we will not close out. A, we only get paid for the retention side of things. We only get paid my company if we get a case signed. So we're very persistent. We're not going to quit so easily. Um, you'd be surprised at how many cases. We won't close out a case until there's 30 days of silence, at least. And if we speak with the claimant, it can keep going. We've retained cases that were seven months in intake. Seven months. Not because we were ha you know, uh, harassing the claimant, but because every time we spoke with them wasn't the right time, but they were still very interested. Oh, I'm going on vacation. Oh, uh, my mother's in the hospital. Now's not a good time. I need to review with my husband. Whatever it is, they're still interested. We kept calling. If, you're, if you've decided in your law firm, if you've come to the conclusion, well, listen, they call, we called four times. Okay, we left four messages. We sent out four emails. They're not interested. That's not true. It's not necessarily true. Why not keep going? Why not hear the words that we know we don't want to hear, but maybe we do? I went with somebody else. 
Because at least we get closure. I'm a big closure guy. Why'd you break up with me? I'm married. Don't worry. I have kids. But I, I'm a big closure guy. Right? If someone doesn't want my law firm, I just want to know for sure. Because it's the worst feeling. It's a worse feeling when I, when I get it after three weeks or five weeks or seven weeks. And I realize, ah, oh, how many of them did I close earlier, years ago? Next one. Mail out percentage versus electronic signature versus in-person at firm versus in-person not at firm. These are the ways you sign up cases. Raise your hand if you're not yet. Yet is there on purpose. If you're not yet using electronic signature for retention. A few hands. Unless there's some law that I'm not aware of, and it might exist in your state for your case type, you need to consider it. Because your competitors are. And because it gives you the ability to do the following. Hi, ma'am. And I could do it a lot better than this, but based on everything you just told me, you qualify for retention. What I'd like to do now, so that we can begin our investigation immediately on your behalf, is to have you sign something called a retainer. I want you to review it, but I'm also going to stay on the phone with you as you review it. So that when we hang up this phone call, you've retained my law office. And there's one less thing you have to worry about. Pretty cool. Everyone here should be doing something like that. Um, average sign-up time between qualifying and signing. We talked about that a little bit before. Um, I hate when, a client, when an intake specialist, and usually it's just lack of training, so we have to fix it. But when an intake specialist says, when are you available to meet with one of our investigators? Oh, next, next Wednesday might work. Excellent. We'll have someone at your house next Wednesday. 2 o'clock sound good? Great. We have, we have to convey urgency for multiple reasons. Two of the obvious reasons are, one, uh, we want to get this investigation started immediately just in case there are any issues we're, we need to be aware of. And two is we want them to be off the market. We don't want them looking elsewhere. So if we could change our question to from when are you free to are you available today at 2 o'clock, that's a big difference. We have to convey urgency. Retained, then rejected percentage. And that's exactly what it sounds like. What percent of cases that we retained did we ultimately reject? Got to keep an eye on this. It tells you about what your intake and retention criteria is. If you're rejecting 50% of the cases that you're retaining, then there's something wrong. We have to figure out why we're we rejecting those cases and can we, can we figure something out earlier on in the intake level, intake stage, so that we don't retain those cases that we're ultimately going to reject. Got to be aware of that. And by the way, you have to do that pretty quickly. You can't wait six months to figure out that some case that was retained, this is the worst. Law firm ends up retaining uh, some case six months, sorry, ends up rejecting some case six months after retention. And then they go yell at the intake staff, why would you retain this case? This is a waste of our money, a waste of our time. We never should have investigated in this. It took you six months to figure that out? You have a bigger issue, much bigger issue. Um, Average number of cases qualified on first call. We talked about that before. So all these uh, uh, CRMs and, and case and intake management software companies, right, they will have a status, which everyone in here should hate, but it's got to be there because there's always an exception to the rule. And that status is under review or investigating or, or, or attorney review, right? And why do I hate it? Because I'm, it's kicking the can down the road. It's not making a decision yet because we're nervous we're going to make the wrong decision. Right? So what we have to figure out is what percent of the cases are we qualifying on the first call? And the ones that we're not, why are we not? Are we not educating or are we not empowering? And those are two big things. And then lastly, the reasons claimants provide for not proceeding. Guys, I want to know this. You learn a lot when you ask a claimant that says, you know what, we went somewhere else. Okay, but you know, before we hang up, and by the way, good luck. You know, I know wherever you went, they're going to treat you well. But just so I know, what was it about our law firm that you chose to go elsewhere? Your intake specialist cursed us out. Oh, they did. I'm so sorry to hear that. Oh, your intake specialist said the only time they had an investigator available was on a Monday, and I'm never available on Mondays. Ask the question. Ask more, get more, guys. Let's learn about where we are weak and where we're strong. Now, this is just basic stuff. We talked about it before, giving you an idea of want percentage, conversion percentage, 
and retained percentage. I don't think we have to go through the math, math per se, but it's certainly there for you. Um, why are we losing qualified cases? This is sort of the other list that uh, I hope you kind of bring back to your firm and, and think about, um, about uh, trying to figure out why you can't maximize ROI sometimes. We may have the wrong person on the phone. If you're not listening to calls, and Seth brought this up earlier, I remember being at uh, my old law firm and going to some, co some conference and them telling me how important it was to hear your staff on the phone and it's, um, it's tough to do it you know, live because you have other work to do. Uh, so I remember starting to listen to calls. The next statement I make is, is, is not exaggerated. Every single phone call was able to be improved. Every single phone call was able to be improved. Now, the first reaction is I'm going to gain some weight and get gray very quick because this is, I'm realizing how, uh, what our issues are. But then the second reaction is, all oh, right, this is, we could fix this. We could, fit, we could talk about it as a team. I could tell everybody what some of these issues are, and I can hold my staff accountable to what my expectations are, right? We used to call them softballs. When a claimant tells you that they've been injured, compassion with reassurance. So, man, what happened? Oh, I, was, I, I just I broke my arm, and I'm in the hospital. One option is, when did that happen? Not a great response. The other option is, oh, my God, I'm so sorry to hear that, compassion, but you did the right thing by calling. We handle cases like that all the time. Can I ask you some questions about what happened? Sure. Compassion and reassurance. It's a softball. It's a great opportunity. And if your team isn't doing that, if they're not thinking about little things to be liked by this claimant, then they lose to the other law firm they just spoke with. Compassion and reassurance. There is nothing more powerful at intake than providing compassion and be re being reassuring. Wrong message being conveyed? It is what it sounds like. If you're not telling the claimant what the law firm can do and how they can do it and why it's important to move forward with the law firm, then you're just answering questions. You know what bothers me? I'm going to tell you a quick story. Two years ago, my iPhone broke. And I kept having to call um, Apple and Verizon because no one was taking responsibility for why it wasn't working. And I went through this for, no joke, three to four months. Now, one might say, Gary, why didn't you just switch phones? I mean, what are you doing? And one of the reasons why is because the tech at Apple, every time, whichever tech it was, every time I called, that tech said to me, oh, <laughs> we handle, we've handled that problem before. Give me some time. I'll figure it out for you. And every time I fell for it, every single time. But it calmed me down. You can imagine, right, how important. I got a family. I got a business. That cell phone, as everyone in here understands, we know it's a pretty important, you know, item for us. But every time he said that, I was willing, my, my stress level, my anger, my impatience would come down a notch or two. Because he said, okay, this person's listening to me, making me feel like they know what I'm going through and they can fix it. And I realized, damn it, that's intake. That's intake. Claimants calling up, all they want to hear is that what they're going through, you can handle. That's all they want to hear. Then you got to be likable. Then you got to give them, you know, the, the most appealing bridge. Then you got to make them sign the case. But at the end of the day, they just want you to reassure them that they did the right thing by picking up the telephone or taking out the telephone and dialing your firm number. And when you start to listen to calls, you're going to realize that that is missing. That component, that intake is missing way too often. Lack of, I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker. Lack of customer service, not categorizing or statusing appropriately in your, in your software. Lack of accountability, not listening to calls. Lack of attorney involvement. I'm going to show you a, a photo in a moment. Not monetizing referrals. I hate this. Guys, referrals are a part of the business. I'm heavily involved in referring cases out. And if I'm not following up on those referrals, there's a possibility of losing money. There's a law firm that I began consulting with, and I realized that they referred out about 500 cases uh, the year prior. 
And I asked them, okay, so how many of those cases um, retained do you get paid on? And they were having a hard time getting me that answer. I said, okay, what are the follow-up processes like with that law firm? And they were having a hard time giving me those answers. And I was getting angry because I realized I wasn't losing money. They were losing money, a lot of money. So we had to go back. And I got to tell you, there were 13 cases that the other law firm resolved. And this law firm was not paid or was not even marked as a referring attorney on. There's way too much money being lost in a poor referral process. Not tracking key performance indicators. Using outdated technology. Not considering appropriate vendors a poor intake culture, not understanding the claimant's mentality. And that's the mentality, the shopper and instant gratification. They shop and they want an answer now. If you make them wait or you make them believe that you're the only game in town, you will lose. And then not recognizing the black holes. Here are some statistics to consider when evaluating your intake. Only 10% of salespeople make more than three contacts. I have a question for you. Let's, you know what? Let's see what it is. New web lead comes in. And be honest, it doesn't matter. I'm not taking your name down. New web lead comes in. How many times, let's go this way. In this room, raise your hand if your firm will follow up at least 10 times before closing the case out for no response. Guys, I see less than five hands. It's a big deal. 80% of sales are made on the 5th to 12th contact. Only 13% of customers believe a salesperson can understand their need. 30 to 50% of sales go to the vendor that responds first. We talked about that. And if you follow up with a web leader within five minutes, you're nine times more likely to convert them. 80% of calls go to voicemail, and 90% of first-time voicemails are never returned. That's why you keep going. That's why you stay persistent. Now, this is a photo. What is it? Anybody? Car dealership. I have that here because sometimes people learn better through a photograph. And I want you to think about this photograph when you go back to your law firm. Raise your hand if you're in a car dealership. Probably everybody here. Excellent. You go and sit down. You speak with a salesperson. You spend a half hour to 45 minutes to go over the, the metrics of the type of vehicle you want. They go over with you what the cost of that is. And you go, ah, you know, ah, I got to think about it. What does the salesperson do next? Come on, say it, somebody, anybody. Get the sales manager. By the way, every time, every time. And I said, damn, another intake lesson. Here I am. You think their ROI, that dealership's ROI is better than your law firm? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. But they realize that their goal is to get a check in their hands and keys in yours. And the best way to do that is to make you feel special. And that if you're a true and interested buyer, they don't want you leaving that door, that, that, that dealership. Why would we not? Now, I don't know if everyone has these resources available to them. But if you did, why would you not get a lawyer on the phone every single time a case qualified? Yes, do I think that's the goal and that should be the golden rule? Of course I do. And there are, you can come down and go to the silver rule, which is every time a case qualified, that was a strong case. Fine. But think about it. If we know, if we're following the blackjack assumption and we, know, and we believe that the claimant is calling two other law firms, I guarantee you, you call three law firms, you're not getting three lawyers on the phone. Don't you want to be the one that puts the lawyer on the phone? Doesn't that put you in a better spot, a better position to win? And isn't it worth your time and money to do that if the case qualifies? I believe it is. Another one. I think everyone in here should go to their, to, should go to Google and type in their law firm name and look at the hours that they're open. Because if you say nine to five, you're hurting your law firm. You guys know it. You all, I'm talking about the injury lawyers here, you all get a lead every once in a while where a claimant just had an accident and is on the way to the hospital or is at the hospital. Accidents happen 24-7. That claimant, who is still not injured terribly enough where they can look up a law firm on Google, 
will look at multiple law firms near me, right, near me, and they'll see times. And they'll skip over everyone that says closed, 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 open. You better be open 24-7. Electronic signature, we talked about it. Did we talk about it? I don't know if we did. Um, we did. You have to be using electronic signature. It has to be in your practice. The gold nuggets. Too many law firms want that clear case, that strong liability, strong injury case. And I submit to you, and I think you'd agree, that you've had many cases, many leads come into your office that were questionable at the outset, but you decided to take a leap of faith and retain that case, and that case turned out to be one of your bigger nuggets, one of your bigger revenue cases of the year. You cannot ignore the smaller cases. You cannot say, ah, that looks like it's going to be a small one. I know it's clear liability, but they're only complaining of a little bit of back pain, and they're not sure they're going to go to the doctor tomorrow. It still might be worth your time. <clears throat> Ten things your firm must do. We're getting to the end here, so for those who are sleeping, wake up. We're almost done. Ten things your law firm must do. Uh, sign more cases, listen to calls, track KPIs, review all decisions made, enforce strict procedures, have attorneys get involved, improve and strengthen your intake packet. It can't be a 10-page retainer. That doesn't work. Um, hold frequent intake meetings. Hold refer out firms more accountable. Keep your intake staff motivated and prepare, prepared. And convey the reassurance, the interest, and the urgency. That's my book. Um, whether it's general answering service, whether it's intake and retention, whether it's consulting, whether you're thinking about getting a mass torch and you want to co-counsel. I am Head deep, underwater, and intake. I love the topic. I think it can have an immediate and significant impact on your revenue. Guys, thank you very much for your time today.